In this next segment of the course, we're going to be looking at quantities that are conserved. And a conserved quantity is one that is the same before and after some sort of an interaction. Okay, and the first of these quantities we'll look at is known as momentum. And the first momentum concept we'll look at is one called impulse. Now first, I want to talk about what is momentum. If you have big objects that are moving fast, you have a lot of momentum. If you have small objects that are moving slow, you have not so much. And the definition of momentum is this. It's just the product of the mass times the velocity. And momentum, defined this way, is conserved inside a system. This is something that we'll talk about. I want to note briefly, at the level we're talking about it, it isn't really a new law of physics, but it's a different way to look at the world. We will use the momentum approach to analyze certain, certain types of interactions, and it's a very productive way to do it. It really simplifies problem solving, gives us a different way to think about things. Now, the type of system we're going to be looking at when we're using momentum is situations where the force is large and the time intervals are short. And under those circumstances, um, what we can do is basically ignore anything except for one force that's happening. So for instance, if I have two objects which are colliding, they're slamming into each other, they exert equal and opposite forces on each other, and these forces are very, very large, and the time of the interaction is short. And under that situation, we are justified to say, look, if I'm, if I'm considering the force on the object on the left, I only have to consider one force, and that is the force of the collision. When you're involved in a car accident, you don't worry about the friction force between the tires and the road. The only force that matters is the force between your car and whatever your car bumped into. That's the only thing you have to consider. That's the sort of thing that we're doing. And one of the technologies that we're going to use to do it is this idea of impulse. Okay. Now the impulse is the area under a force versus time curve, as you can read about in chapter 9. But typically, since the times are short, we're not going to worry about the variation, and we're typically going to say we're just going to be interested in the average force of the collision. So when I talk about the force in a collision, really what I mean is the average force. And the average force is related to the change in momentum of an object this way. The average force is equal to delta P over delta T, or the change in momentum is equal to the average force times delta T. Now note, these equations don't appear in the text because they always had the intermediate term of impulse. But we will use these to solve problems if they satisfy the definition of an impulsive interaction, i.e. one where the forces are large and the time is short, and basically we can ignore any motion um, during the pro we, I'm sorry, we can ignore other forces during the process, and the object is pretty much not going anywhere during that process. Under those kind of situations, we can use these two relationships. Okay, here's the kind of situation we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at an auto collision. Now, when a car collides with a stationary barrier, and I've got here a car running into a pole, the time of the collision is about a tenth of a second, very, very short time, and we know that the forces are going to be very large, and so we've satisfied the, the rationale, or we satisfy the criteria for treating this as an impulse problem, for dealing with impulse, and for using the idea of momentum, okay, to look at this collision. Because the force is large enough that if we look at the free body diagram of the car during the collision, there's the force of the pole on the car, okay, and that's pretty much all we have to look at. It's so much larger than everything else, we can ignore everything else. And that's what saying we can treat this as a momentum or an impulse problem means. The force is so large during the time of the collision, we will ignore everything else. And in this case, what is the force in the collision? Now, we, let's start by strategizing. And we've already kind of laid out what our strategy is. We said our strategy is we're going to treat this as an impulse problem. Okay, we can treat this using momentum ideas because we know the force is large and the time interval is short. That's our strategy. Now for preparation, what we're going to do is this. And this is important in these laws dealing with, or in these problems dealing with conservation laws. We always draw a before and an after picture. Okay? Conservation laws help you deal with situations where you can look at the case before 
the interaction and then after the interaction. And then we don't have to worry about the messy details of the interaction. And our before after pictures really easy. Before, what the car looks like is this. I have the car. Actually, let's draw something that looks more car-like. Here we go. I have a car and it's moving along at 10 meters per second. That's my before picture. My after picture is this. I have a car and it's not moving. So the V final is equal to zero. V initial is 10 meters per second. That's my before and my after picture, okay? And there was clearly a change in momentum between the initial and the final case. And actually, I can compute what the change in momentum is. Okay, we know what the initial momentum is, okay? The initial momentum is just equal to the mass times the velocity of the car. Well, the mass of the car is 2,000 kilograms. The speed is 10 meters per second. And so the initial value of the momentum is 20,000 kilograms meters per second. The final momentum is equal to zero. And so the change in momentum between the initial and the final case was just 20,000 kilograms meters per second. I'm not worried about the sign. I know that it decreases, okay? And we can use that to compute the average force. And to do that, to do our solution, we're going to say this. The average force is just equal to the change in momentum divided by the time interval. Well, the change in the momentum, we said, was 20,000 kilograms meters per second. And the time interval was 0 0.1 seconds. Oop, that was a little messy. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. 0 0.10 seconds. And so we compute an average force of 200,000 newtons. And that is a big force. Compare that to the weight of the car. The weight of the car is approximately 20,000 newtons. So that's 10 times the weight. So if I was to draw a scaled free body diagram, we would see something like this. Here's the value of the force from the pole on the car. The weight force is going to be one-tenth of that. It's going to be pretty tiny. The normal force will be pretty tiny as well, and any kind of a friction force is going to be small as well. And so clearly, we are justified in saying this is a situation of large force, short time, and we get an average force of 200,000 newtons in this case. And here's my assessment. Is this reasonable? And the answer is, yeah, the force is really, really large. But we expect a really, really large force when a car hits a pole. Now, I saw a car do this once. I was driving down the road, and I saw a car hit a pole. And I saw, like, one thing. The pole broke off. Okay, so the pole broke. And also, the car crumpled. And I thought to myself, well, that's weird. I mean, that's a large force. But these are supposed to be strong objects. Why would they break? Why would they crumple? And they break and they crumple for a very specific reason, and that's this. Since the average force is delta P over delta T, if the time is large, the force is smaller. And what you want to do is you want to make the collision take place over a longer interval of time to minimize the forces in the collision. So in a car, you have an airbag that brings you to rest slowly. The car has crumple zones. Again, that lets it come to rest slowly. A pole that a car might hit is designed to break off so the car can come to rest more slowly. And there's other places where you see this. The Mars Pathfinder, one of the probes we sent to Mars, um, actually had giant airbags on it, and that's how it landed because it turns out parachutes don't work well in the thin Martian atmosphere. And another thing that uses it is hedgehogs. And hedgehogs, um, when they're going to fall, roll up into a ball, and basically they're surrounded by a crash cushion. This is something we will talk about in our in-person session. Now, I'm going to look at another type of impulse problem that we can look at, and this is another one um, that uses this formalism. So this ant right here is known as a trap jaw ant, and they're creatures that set traps for them. And, they're, and, and what happens is they build these little sand pits Okay, and then the ant is going to like slide down the side and it's going to the center and there's this creature that is trying to capture it down at the bottom. The ant has to get out of there. How can it do it? How can it do it? And it can't climb because it's actually going to slide down the slope. The sand grains are really, really loose. What it does is it's got really, really strong jaws that it uses to catch prey. But the other thing it can do with its jaws is it can just bite really hard and slam its jaws into the ground and that lets it um, 
basically fling itself to safety. It hits the ground so hard with its mandibles that it flings it into the air. And let's look at some values. A 12 milligram ant hits the ground with an average force of 47 millinewtons. Okay, now I'm gonna note that that force is much, much greater than the weight of the ant. And so that tells us immediately that we are justified to think about this using momentum uh, the momentum I, uh, uh, formalism and also the time 0.13 milliseconds very very short time and so as a consequence we know that we've got large force and we've got short time intervals that sets us up for a strategized step which is to say we're going to treat this using impulse we're going to treat it using impulse for the preparation what we're going to do is we're going to draw a before and after picture. And it's really important that you do this, okay? It might seem like you can just jump to sticking numbers and equations, but, but don't. It's really important to be able to wrap your mind around the problem that you do this. So here's my before picture. I've got the ground and I've got an ant, and here's my ant, okay, on the ground, and it's going to not be moving. And so the initial speed is zero. And then afterwards, we have an ant, and the ant is, sorry, I'm not very good at drawing ants. The ant is moving upward at some speed, VF. That is, in fact, what we're trying to find out. And we can compute the original momentum. The initial momentum is equal to zero. The final momentum of the ant is just equal to the mass of the ant times VF. Okay, that's our preparation step. We got our before, we have our after picture. And with that in hand, we're ready to solve. And we're going to use this relationship that says the change in momentum is equal to the average force times the time interval. Now, the change in momentum, um, it changes from zero to m times vf, okay? And so the change in momentum is just equal to m times vf. And so I can rewrite the expression like this. The mass of the ant times the ant's final speed is equal to the average force times the time interval. Now notice this. In the problem statement, we were given a time interval. We are given a time interval of 0 0.13 milliseconds, and we are given the average force of 47 millinewtons. And we know the mass of the ant. The mass of the ant is 12 milligrams. And so we have everything in hand to be able to solve for this final speed. And if we do that, I get 0 0.51 meters per second. Okay, I get 0 0.51 meters per second. Next piece of the puzzle, of course, is to assess. And for my assessment, I'm gonna say 0 0.51 meters per second is not a very high speed, okay? That's like um, two meters per second, or, uh, or uh, one meter per second is about two miles per hour, so that's about one mile per hour. On the other hand, the little trap that the ant has to get out of get out of is very, very small. And it got up to that speed by slamming its jaws into the ground. So my assessment is it doesn't have to go very far. And that speed is actually plenty to let it escape from the trap. And um, we wouldn't expect it to launch itself into the stratosphere. It just has to get itself a short distance. My assessment is this is good. Now the next piece of the puzzle is we're going to use the idea of conservation of momentum, the idea that momentum is conserved in certain interactions. And the animal we're going to consider, which is the poster child for this sort of thing, is the squid. And that's what we'll deal with in our next set of slides.